Ash Princess, Chapter 6, Plot Every muscle in my body screams when Hoa enters my room and draws the curtains to let the sun in. I want to roll over and beg to go back to sleep, but I can't risk anything that could seem suspicious after Blaze's stunt with the guards. I was up until nearly dawn, scrubbing the grime from my skin and stuffing the unsalvageable nightgown into a hole in the underside of my mattress. Terrified that at any moment, those three sets of snores would stop and I would be caught. But mercifully, they were still sleeping when I finally drifted off. Hoa will notice the nightgown missing soon, but there are much simpler explanations for that than treason. Yesterday feels like a dream, or more like a nightmare, but it wasn't. It might be the only real day I've lived in the last decade. The thought gives me energy enough to sit up and blink away my blariness. I drag through the motions of getting ready, and if Hoa notices my days or the difference between the nightgown I wear and the one she dressed me in last night, she gives no sign. As she, write, as she wraps vivid orange silk around me and pins it to my shoulder with a lapis lazuli pin, my mind is far from idle. If Blaze is right and the prince is interested in me, I'm not sure where to start and I've seen Calavaxian courtship rituals play out many times, ending in marriage or death and nothing in between. But whatever the prince wants from me, it won't be marriage. His father would never allow it. The caser may have given me a title and other luxuries, but he will never grant me any more rights than any other Astrian slave. Lower, I tell Hawa. Her forehead creases in confusion, so I move the pin down myself. It's only a couple of inches because it causes the neckline to dip low uh, and exposes more of my chest. I've seen courtesans show far more skin. Even Dagmar routinely wears much more scandalous things. Still, Hoa's eyes are disapproving. If she knew what I was doing, she would applaud me, wouldn't she? Or maybe she would tattle to the Kaiser before I could so much as draw a breath. As soon as Hoa finishes arranging my hair and painting my face, there's a knock at the door, and without waiting for an answer, Crescentia glides in wearing a dress of sky-blue silk. A small leather-bound book is clasped in her hand. Like my dress, hers is draped in the Astrian style, though I've missed the loose flowing sheathings for years while I was forced to sweat in fitted Calavaxian velvets. It always turns my stomach to see anyone, even Cress, wear Astrian dresses. It feels like another thing that's been taken from me. I wonder if she knows that it's too late to facilitate movement that it's made for dancing and riding and running. Now it's merely ornamental, just as we're supposed to be. Hello, darling, she chirps, eyes starting briefly to my lowered neckline. I wait for a point of comment, a barb like she throws when Dagmer wears something outrageous, but she only smiles. I thought we could take a walk outside today. Maybe down to the beach? I know how you love the sea, and I could use some help with these poems. Lyrian is more challenging than I anticipated. I was six when I first met Crescentia, and lonely. No one spoke to me, and I wasn't allowed to speak to anyone. I was, however, required to attend meals in the banquet hall and lessons with the noble children. Not that the lessons actually mattered. Since my Kelovaxian was rough at best, and the teacher spoke too quickly for me to keep up with her, I all but disappeared into my own mind, 
fantasies of being rescued and finding my mother alive played over and over in my head. Anyone who wanted to pull me out of my fantasies had a hard time of it, though the Kaiser had given permission for any person of Calovaxian blood to strike me. The other children were the most vicious. They pinched and slapped and kicked me until I was black and blue and bloody, and no one stopped them. Even the teacher only watched me with a wary eye, ready to step in if it looked like an irreparable damage was being done. That was where the Kaiser drew the line. I wasn't of any use to him if I was dead. The worst was Nilsson, who was two years older and looked like a block of pale wood, yellow and hard-edged and just as wide as tall. Even his face reminded me of the swirls and rings in the wood grain. He had a fascination with water that wasn't unusual for Calavaxians, but it took on a sadistic twist that I'm not sure even the fine was capable of. The first time he shoved my head in a water basin and held me there, thick figures digging into the back of my neck as I thrashed against him. I had the good sense or maybe it was foolishness, to kick him between the legs and break away when he doubled over, both of us gasping for breath. Luckily, I caught mine first and ran. Unluckily, he learned from his mistake. The next day, his two friends held me in place, and no matter how much I struggled and tried to kick, I couldn't get free. My lungs burned and the edges of my mind began to blur. I was almost looking forward to passing out, maybe even seeing my mother again in the after, when suddenly the hands were gone and I was pulled out by a much gentler grip. My dazed mind thought that she was a goddess at first. The Astrian fire god, Uza, had a daughter named Avavia, who was the goddess of safety. She sometimes took the guise of a child to do her work and I certainly could have her used, could have used her help. I only caught a glimpse of Nilsson and his friends as they fled the room as fast as their stubby legs could carry them. Are you all right? She spoke Calovaxian slowly so I could understand her. I couldn't form words, only cuff, but she rubs, she rubbed circles on my back reassuringly, a maternal gesture I recognized later as strange, considering that her mother had died when she was an infant. They won't come after me, she continued. I told them my father would burn their skin from their bones as if they ever, and if they ever laid a finger on me again. She had to mind for me as she spoke, but I understood well enough. Husa was more than capable of such a feat. But as the spots cleared from my vision and my mind came back to earth, I realized this girl was no goddess. Olavia might have taken the guise of a child, but none of the gods would ever look like a Calabaxian, and this girl was the epitome of them. From her pale skin and flaxen hair to her small, delicate features, as I caught my breath, she told me her name and proclaimed that we were friends, as if it were as simple as that. To Crescentia, it was. She makes friends as easily as she breathes, and for reasons I still don't understand. I became her favorite. There are moments when I wonder if it's something her father pushed her into in order to keep a better eye on me but I also know that she cares for me in a way I'll never be able to match. I love her, but today I can't look at her without seeing her father dragging his dagger across my mother's throat. In a strange way, I think part of what drew us together was our shared loss. We're both girls with dead mothers. I glance at her dress which has been sewn with small pieces of aquamarine around the hem and neckline that match her eyes perfectly. Oh no, Cress, I say with a sly smile. 
You're far too pretty to only go down to the beach today. I pause as if the idea is just coming to me, though I've been putting together a plan since last night. Do you know what the prince is doing? We could just happen to wander by. I lift my eyebrows meaningfully. Cress's cheeks turn pink and she bites her bottom lip. Oh, I wouldn't dare. Plenty of other girls would dare, I tell her. He's grown up handsome, don't you think? Even the dead men might decide he's a better prize than that ancient duke she's been angling for. She chews harder on her lip and smiles. He is awfully handsome, isn't he? Taller than I thought he would be. Last time I saw him, I had a few inches on him, but now he towers over me. My father says he's an excellent warrior as well, the best he's seen in years. How long will he be here, do you know? I ask. My father says he's back for good, she says, cheeks dimpling as her smile widens. He'll still go off when he's needed in battle, but this will be his home now. The Kaiser's insisting he join the court. A marriage likely won't be far off now that he's seventeen. And I'm sure every other girl in the court has gotten that same idea in her head, Cress. You'd be wise to get ahead of them quickly. So where is the prince today? I ask again. She hesitates a breath more, but I know I have her. Inspecting new battleships, she admits, in the South Harbor. Perfect, I say brightly, taking her hand in mine and leading her from the room. We'll get to see the water as well, then, just like you wanted to. Battleships. Why on earth would the Kelovaxians need more battleships? Usa knows that they have plenty already. I tear my thoughts away from that idea as we leave Hoa behind. She isn't allowed in public spaces, so it's only Crescentia's two maids who accompany us. And my shadows, of course, though they'll keep a careful distance. This time I force myself to look at the slaves. I won't keep ignoring them. They deserve more from me than that. Who were they before the siege? I don't even know their names. Crescentia never addresses them, only snapping her fingers when she needs assistance. The younger of the two looks up and meets my gaze briefly, and something sparks in her eyes before she averts them. I'm not sure whether it's defense, deference, or hatred.